So last class, and kind of the uh, I guess the uh, the last major step, um, getting your application onto the web. Because up until this point, you've only been uh, working in a development environment. So I, I'm kind of hesitant to say this is the last step because when I do these things, and you know, maybe that's just because of um, uh, the experience. I always start at the deployment and work backwards before I even start developing the application. But for you guys, this is the next natural step. So um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of JavaScript. Um, this wasn't really the main focus of the course, and it's always kind of left as a bonus. But I'll give you some resources and a demo that I created myself. And uh, of course, you're always free to ask me questions about that. And I'll, I'll give you a tour about and how it works. Uh, so yeah, we're going to deploy our application to uh, a service called Heroku, and this is what we call Pass or Platform as a Service, and that's all they do. They just provide you the infrastructure to um, to actually deploy your application. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about testing and quality assurance. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about. And I've been kind of joking about going off on a rant because sometimes that does happen. Um, but yeah, very important, especially for would-be developers and people who want to uh, continue on uh, learning this trade. And uh, then you'll have some opportunity to finish up your app. Um, you can take as much time as you need. There's some debate as to whether we're going to the pub or ordering pizza. Um, I guess we'll see when Jen gets here. Um, so yeah, but you'll have that time to yourself and you can, uh, you can stay as long as you want. So, JavaScript. Yeah, you know what? Let's just save this to the last. Um, so to deploy to Heroku, we need to, to take a few steps um, because uh, uh, probably one of the most significant steps is uh, changing up the database a little bit because you guys have been using uh, SQLite, which is fine for, uh, for development, uh, but is much less robust uh, when, when you actually offer the service up on the web. So. I'm not even sure Heroku actually supports it. Maybe it does. I don't usually use Heroku. I do this kind of stuff by myself. Um, oh, yeah, we're just kind of glossing over all this stuff. So we're going to get to the demo really quickly. Um, but when you were doing your applications, and, uh, you know, this is partially because of my leading as well, you would take these small steps, make small changes, and refresh your browser. Um, you do this repeatedly over and over again starts eating up time so um, this is the kind of thing we have computers for it's just to automate mundane tasks um, and that's really what testing is um, we write programs to simulate uh, sometimes user interaction or just sometimes interaction with different components in our system and we just uh, make these tests so they're automatic we don't have to go click on the button and try you know different try leaving out your password and trying to put it back in and that kind of stuff, right? It just, it takes time and it's a very expensive time when you're talking about development. Um, now we always bring up this, uh, uh, yeah, well, let's talk a little bit more in depth. Uh, unit testing is, is that basic functionality within the, within the program. So you're not really testing most clicks you're more testing to make sure that your validations pass and this kind of thing. Uh, integration testing is when we start um, simulating these mouse clicks or having a user fill out a form. Um, usually when I do this, I write the test first, make sure they fail, and then write the code to make them pass. This is called test-driven development. And I do that both on the unit testing side and the integration side. Um, there's this uh, continuous integration now, this is kind of a big, wide testing suite, and it's uh, very suitable to large projects with large teams working on it. Um, what you'll do is you'll be working on your one individual piece of code. Uh, you'll commit your changes, and then the con continuous integration um, will bring all the, the, the different pieces together and run the complete set of tests to see if uh, anything breaks. And this just happens on an ongoing basis, which is why we call it continuous. Um, traditional Q&A, um, I've always taken this. I've only ever actually seen it probably, in, well, maybe two places. Uh, 
that's that's debatable. But uh, this is actually just having the human operator come along and uh, follow a script. I used to work for a, an oil and gas company um, that did exactly that. They basically just paid a guy to, to do this over and over and over again, follow the, follow the script. And it's, you know, you're, you're not, these, these kind of workers aren't cheap. Um, so this always just kind of drove me nuts. But that's, that's really traditional Q&A. Um, to do a lot of this stuff, uh, so we've got a couple of tools named here. In the uh, Ruby world, probably RSpec is dominant. Minitest is kind of the, the default testing package. Um, it's good to learn everything you can about testing, but if you're going to, to pursue this, uh, RSpec is probably the, probably the one you want, just because it has, I'd say it has more users. And if something's popular like that, then guaranteed people are going to run into the same problems you have. And you, when you do run into these problems, you can Google and then uh, find the answer. Uh, yeah, so we got uh, lots of different ways to learn to code. Um, uh, Lighthouse Labs really fills a gap that most of these ones don't, and that is uh, people like me who just come and walk you through it. Um, the the full time boot camp is a lot less scripted than this part time cohort, but it's uh, um, well, just there's more need for for mentors and people in that capacity. But uh, lots of free online resources. So if you're not sure if you know this is just some, a hobby you want to pick up or you want to build a business or something, um, there's plenty, plenty of places to learn. Um, and I just remember I I started my first degree in 1996. And uh, we didn't have Google back then, even up until I graduated with my undergrad degree. Uh, just to think, you know, programming is always going to be hard, but it's a lot easier now than it used to be. So, uh, and I think it's a lot more accessible as well. Um, yeah, and practice. Really, the only way to learn this is just brute force repetition. It's, uh, I, I think anyone can learn it. It's just really the people who are passionate and see this uh, as a, a mode of self-expression are the ones that really pick it up. And you have to be determined because you are going to run into problems and get discouraged. It happens to me every single day. So you have to have patience as well. Um, yeah. And whether we go to the pub or whether we order pizza, um, if you are interested in the boot camp, if you have any questions, um, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of, of when is the, uh, boot camp start? Uh, January, I want to say January 6th, might be January 4th. So yeah, eight weeks. Uh, well, if uh, we hold to history, then there will be two next year. Um, I'm hoping that there will be more. <laughs> but it's really just about demand and getting people interested. So it's slowly building. The part-time classes used to be only offered twice a year as well, I think. And, uh, well, we're offering them pretty much continuously now. So, okay. So let's just, let's get this thing onto the web. Um, so I'm going to go back to my same old, uh, same old rocket stove demo. I'll run it just to make sure everything's okay. Um, so yeah, the big difference here is that when you turn off Cloud9, of course, you uh, your your application shuts down as well. Um, this really kind of it's not that it defeats the purpose of the web, but it sure undermines our expectations of what. Uh, the modern web should be. So you should be able to access this thing 24 hours a day. Um, so I just want to get it from here to something on Heroku. Uh, if you haven't already, I encourage you to sign up. It's free, of course. And you can have uh, five virtual servers, or maybe it's four. I think it's five. Um, uh, very, very scant resources, but uh, you, you don't need uh, a, a lot of resources to do what you guys are doing. And if you were to uh, make a very popular application, then the basic Heroku service would not be sufficient for you. So that's that's kind of the idea, it's, is to get your, your application in production uh, cheaply and quickly. So easy, go sign up. Um, and then uh, I'll follow some instructions which uh, mirror what you've done in your um, Instagram or sorry, uh, yeah, your own projects and then the, uh, the coursework that follows. Um, so this is kind of just laying out what you're going to be doing uh, anyway. So first thing we need to do 
is just count for account for a couple of software dependencies. So as I mentioned before, SQL Lite is great for development, um, not so good for production. So Heroku uses an, a database called Postgres primarily, and this is a, a very popular one. Um, to do this, we need a couple of gems um, to interface with that system. So here's my gem file. And down below this, um, I, I just need these dependencies in production. So I say group production do. And unless I'm in a production environment like Heroku, anything or anything listed here won't be installed. It's just, you know, to keep, uh, keep your footprint down on your disk and with your memory resources. So first one I need, and this is kind of a, a Heroku specific thing is my understanding. Uh, it's a gem maintained by Heroku. Uh, this, this just takes care of some of that stuff that you would otherwise be doing yourself if you were a, a professional dev, dev op. Um, this one's the, the really big one, the PG gem, which just stands for Postgres. And this provides you with the database uh, interface and connection itself. So now that I've installed these things, or sorry, I've, I've named them, I put them in my gem file. Um, I have to install them. So I run bundle install. And it's not really going to install because this isn't a production environment, but it is going to uh, change your gem lock file, which is important. Okay, so while we're waiting for that, uh, this was a question I had earlier when I was preparing. But if you like, if you guys have your, your projects open, do you have a config folder on the left-hand side in your directory tree? You do, and there's, is there a file named database.rb? Okay, so I thought you might have to create this file, um, but I've, I've given you some instructions, or I'll give you some instructions when I send out the, the, the lecture summary. Um, about how to configure this. So nothing you really need to worry about the details. This is sort of semi-advanced stuff. Um, but I'm going to modify this to make it um, a little bit more agreeable to Heroku, although this kind of looks correct. Does yours look like this? Similar? I think this is the whole file. Yeah, but you'll see where it's setting your database adapter. Um, it should have a different option. Um, the option really should be asking the question, as you can see here, well, is this environment the, the development environment? Because if it is, then I need to do something different. I want to use uh, SQL Lite. If it's not the development environment, and here's where the option comes in. So I just copied and pasted. I want to do this instead. So this was this was the same as it was before, but now I've added this else clause, and this is where um, the PG or the Postgres connection is made. This only happens, of course, when it's in development. Okay, so that's the the next update. Um, that will be provided to you. So now we ought to set up Heroku. And again, this is um, something that you will find documented, so you don't, don't really have to write it down or stress about it too much. Um, but what I need is the command line utility. So, so for some of you guys, this will have been new. You guys have been working on the command line. Um, we need to interface with Heroku the same way. And to do this, we need a program that they provide off their website. So I just pasted the command to install it. That's what it's doing. Again. Um, this is all provided in the course notes. Okay, so now that allows me to run this program, Heroku, and I press enter. So I haven't um, actually logged in yet. That's what it's asking me for. This is why you need to create an account. So the first thing it's asking me to do is just, you know, provide my, my email. 
oops.ca and password. So now I'm logged into Heroku and I can start talking back and forth with the service. Uh, first thing I want to do is actually actually create an application or sorry, the resources for the application. So I use the Heroku create command. So hopefully this is, you know, you've got a good feel for uh, using the command line by this point. Um, it's just going to allocate those resources and assign me an, a URL or a machine name. Um, it's kind of a random machine name or pseudo random. You can, of course, set this to something a little bit more friendly to you. And of course, you can also go to GoDaddy or some other similar uh, registrar and register your own domain. So that's an option as well if you really want to show this thing off. But I'm just using this default one. So I'm going to, for now, um, well, I'll leave that because sometimes, well, there we go. Okay, so there it is. Just waiting for something. So this is the default Heroku thing. It's just saying, okay, well, now I need some code to execute. <coughs> so having done this, whoops, having created this resource, and I probably should have shown you this before, but it's going to change something to your Git configuration. So I just want to find out what remotes I've, I've got attached to this repository. So I say Git remote minus V. And if you if you notice, um, this vast woodland thing has created a repository on Heroku. This is where you're going to push your code. So when you push your code to Heroku through Git, it automatically sets everything up, um, well, except for database migrations, and it uh, prepares your application for deployment. So very, very simple stuff. But before you can push, of course, you have to commit all your changes. So I'm just going to do the shorthand. This should all be review get updates so just make it really fast and dirty press enter whoops i think i missed something oh yes i did get commit minus am there we go so now now everything's committed now everything's ready to be pushed but instead of pushing to github i am going to push to heroku i say git push heroku uh, master. I probably don't need the master, but there it goes. So now it's, you know, it's just uh, calculating the changes. Um, and then you're going to start seeing some feedback from Heroku where it starts installing your gem file. Of course, you know, GitHub doesn't do this. This is just all part of what uh, Heroku does. So far, so good. Oh, I think I just thought of a problem here. Uh-oh. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, actually, I'm going to check that out just just to avoid any any prob problems here. Um, without getting into too many details, I know this just from earlier today. This is a problem. Um, so I'm going to comment that out just to make it work. And I'm going to push it again. So I'll say git commit minus am comment pry require. Git push Heroku. Let's try that again. Building it, compiling it. You do this every single time you make a change. Every time you're ready to, uh, to uh, deploy your new application or your improved application to the web. Do you have to update the master every time? Uh, yes. That's how you get it into production. Okay, so hopefully if I did everything right here, I should at least see my page. Um, I'm kind of nervous about that, actually. Oh, I knew something weird was going to happen. Okay. Um, if you ever run into a problem like this, uh, there's, there's um, a fast, easy way to restart. That's just using Heroku. Restart like that. Hopefully that's sufficient, otherwise we got to start looking at the log files. Okay, so it says it's restarting the dynos. That's what Heroku calls servers. Try that again. Oh, internal server error. Okay. So now, if you have something like this, you can always check the logs. So I guess this is kind of a good thing because now you're learning a little bit more 
oh, sorry, not git logs, Heroku logs. And what this does is it just retrieves error output or access output from, uh, from, from your application on the Heroku server. So I hit enter, it's talking. Okay, what's it saying? Something wrong with the gems. Hmm. Well, that's very discouraging. Uh, let's try Heroku uh, run bundle install. There's also a chance. Okay, so it says it's okay. I'm going to do a Heroku restart again. Okay. Oh, man. I got a bad feeling about this. Yeah, it's still not working. Okay, so what do we do? Google it. <laughs> I actually did Google it. Uh, I ran into this exact same problem, and I managed to get it working, but I forgot one critical step. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't like that pry requirement. So um, what I'm going to do, I think I can do this. Heroku. Heroku delete. No, Heroku help. Uh, it doesn't look like it gives me any option to do that. Okay, so I'm going to do it even more brute force. I'm going to go to my Heroku dashboard here. And I'm going to delete the one I just did. So this is, I admit, this is kind of amateur, but... Oh, can't have you guys sitting here watching me do this. So I'm going to delete this thing. It's kind of hard to find, just like GitHub. You have to bring it up and then go to settings. And then you got to go down to here and say delete app. And the same old trick. You sure you want to do that? Yes. Delete the application. So from the top, Heroku. Create. Uh, Git. Oh, wait. So now we got to make sure that we got the right remote. So that's uh, Dry Reef Heroku app. And I'm going to copy that guy. Git remote minus V. Oh, see, it's still the vast woodland one. So what I have to do is I have to say Git remote remove Heroku get remote add Heroku and then I need my git repository you guys have all done this before that's woodland where do you go Dry Reef. It didn't give me the... That's what I'm... Dry Reef. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of guess here. Get... Get... And... Get... Heroku... App.com slash dry reef uh, get. Oh man, I hope I did that right. Okay, let's try it. Git add everything. Git commit minus am get updates. Git push Heroku. Oh no. Hit remote minus V. 
All right, so I can find out what the actual address is here. Hopefully. It's just called Dry Reef. Is that it there? No, to remove Heroku. Get remote add Heroku. Get push Heroku. Come on. Oh, there we go. I'll leave that instruction just in case you fall, come and run into the same problem, how you add uh, a new remote. So uh, hopefully you won't have that kind of trouble. Seems like it's taken longer than last time. Um, while it's doing that, we'll sort of talk a little bit about JavaScript. So this is a, a demo I created for a cohort just like yours um, a long time ago. Um, this is all JavaScript. There's no um, no back end to this at all aside from the server itself. And uh, so what's happening here is that uh, using JavaScript combined with a little bit of CSS, I'm able to, to produce this um, pseudo random animation of this uh, chaotic world. So let's uh, bear that in mind. I'm going to come back to here. Still going. Um, so what this demonstrates, this is uh, what's called Con Conway's Game of Life. Uh, he, Con John Conway was a British mathematician, and he invented what is called, or what is regarded as the world's most famous zero-player game. So it's a game in the sense that it takes turns and it has rules. And if you apply the rules and the chaos before you just kind of disappears. So to get that started and to apply those rules, again, this is all JavaScript. I press the go button and the rules start applying. And you see it starts to look like, uh, well, <coughs> a Petri dish, really. Is this cellular automatic? Is yeah, that's exactly what it is. This is a two-dimensional cellular cellular automata that's right and if you're really curious about this so this uh this page conway's game of dot life um i put my code on github and i thought i linked to i thought i linked to the wikipedia one but uh this is the idea. So every state in, in the universe, um, the rules are very simple. There's four of them. So if you have a live cell, that's one of the ones with the, uh, the white colored. Um, if it has two living neighbors, or if it has fewer than two living neighbors, that cell dies. It just turns to orange. Um, any living cell with more than three live neighbors dies as though it was starved out or something similar. And any living cell with two or three live neighbors it's on to the next generation. So this is that, uh, I guess, they found the balance in the ecosystem. And any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a living cell. So you apply those simple rules over and over again, and uh, chaos or becomes ordered. So I always, I always get lost in that. Let's see how our thing is doing. Still installing. Um, so on this page, though, and again, if you're really interested in JavaScript, I've kind of just invited people to uh, submit their own. So this is my code here on GitHub. And you can use this as a starting point. So here's uh, just the regular stuff, index.html. 
Um, you link your JavaScript files the same way you do with your CSS style sheets. You use a slightly different tag, but the, the idea is the same. Um, you have to tell the browser that you need um, this script right at the bottom. And usually when we're doing with JavaScript, this is kind of a finer point. Uh, we usually put it at the very bottom, the body doc part of the document. Uh, this just makes sure that it doesn't get executed until the page is rendered. So just a little trick. You can also put it up in the head. There's really nothing wrong with that. You just have to make a couple of steps to make sure that um, it doesn't execute before the browser is ready. Um, you also see a couple of, a little bit of metadata. So I set this up so it's really easy to share on Facebook. This is, that's just what it does, right? It uh, shows you what image you want and what description. So if you've ever wondered how that happens when you're posting, it's uh, these little tags. And these are um, all documented on the Facebook website. So if you want to actually look at the program, it's not very long. So I've got my images. That's just the stop and go button. Uh, I've got some style sheets. Nothing super elaborate. And then I've got the actual code itself. So this is what's executed in the browser. And uh, historically, JavaScript has always been run inside the browser. Um, it's getting less and less new all the time. But uh, what we've been doing as of late is running JavaScript on the server side as well, using a uh, JavaScript framework called Node, Node.js. Um, that's actually what I spent most of my day today doing. So this is client-side JavaScript. Looks a little bit different than what you're used to in Ruby. In fact, it should look a lot different. Like, this should be a brand new language because it really is. Totally different way to uh, express yourself. But what I've done is I've defined a few functions that take up care of a few actions on the page. So here's a good example. I want to press that go button or that stop button. It's the same function that handles the event that uh, uh, raises when that action is performed. If um, if there's chaos, then I just want to show that go image. If, uh, if, if not, if the go button has been pressed, then I want to see the stop image. And you see that here. Okay. Would that be equivalent to strike? Is that what it's called? Exclamation mark? Exclamation mark? Yeah, within, uh, within Ruby, it's like if it's not. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the bang, yes. The bang. Yeah, this one right here. So um, all this is doing is because chaos is a, is a true false value. Um, so if, it, if, it, if it's currently chaotic, if it's just that pseudo random world being generated over and over again, this will evaluate to true. And you apply the bang or the not, it inverts it. So wherever you see the bang, it just means the opposite of whatever's contained in that variable. Um, so when you get to that point, if there's chaos, it will turn to false. It makes that test. If false, nope. Else, and it gets down to here, and it displays the stop button. So you see that like this, boop, 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 like that, over and over again. So that's the kind of stuff you have to take care of when you're using JavaScript. Let's take a look on, OK, so here we are. Oof. I'm a little bit nervous. Because we didn't have such a good good uh, experience this last time around. Um, but before I do, just in case it does fail miserably, we're going to move on to something else, talk a little bit more about JavaScript perhaps. Um, when you do this, you still have to tell Heroku to, uh, to create or migrate your database. Um, and it's not that much different. So up until this point, whenever you started your assignment new, um, you probably did something like this, rake db migrate, or you executed it through the bundler. You have to run this exact same command on Heroku. To do that, you just prefix it, and you say Heroku, Heroku run. That's all that's happening there. So I'm just telling Heroku, this is the command I want executed on your server. I press Enter, keep my fingers crossed. Oh, and it worked. It gave me a deprecation warning, but it worked. 
It's wonderful news. Okay, so if I come back to here, holding my breath. Oh, that's the wrong one. So I'm looking at the uh, wrong URL. Where is my app? Open app. Here we are. And there it is. Wonderful. That's actually quite a relief. Um, so uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I may or may not include this, but you also need to seed your data. Because if I were to go at this point and just try to log in, even though I've had my password set, there's no... Oh, look at that. That shouldn't have happened. So something's up. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe I did seed it when I migrated. Anyway. Um, yeah, let's not dwell on that too much. That's kind of weird. Let's talk a little bit more about Conway's. So a bunch of different functions um, and also event listeners. So whenever you like click on a button or you hover over a button, any action you perform on the document is going to generate what's called an event. Um, to use JavaScript effectively, you need to listen for these events to happen. So that's what's happening here. I've got my controls, which I took off the document, and I start adding event listeners. So every time um, the button is clicked, I call this toggle chaos. So this is kind of a weird looking way to do it, but that's that function there every single time it happens. Some other similar ones, uh, mouse over. Uh, which one is that applied to? Oh, it's this one. So every time I hover my mouse over top of the button, the opacity, that's if I can see through it or not. It changes. It goes to one. I can no longer see the background. If I move my mouse, I can kind of see the background underneath. That's that's the opacity. Uh, what else? The mouse leave, that sets it back to 0.6. So, you know, you can kind of see 40% of the light coming through from the backside of the, the, the <coughs> button. There's the function. Here's something that makes it um, mobile-friendly. So believe it or not, this is actually a mobile-friendly app. And if you change the size, that's what it's looking at. It's saying did the width of the screen change. And if it did, perform the calculations and just make it bigger, basically. So this won't spread down. Well, it's not going to just because it's uh, too far. But yeah, so now it does the same kind of thing. It fills the entire screen, does the whole bit. And if you turn it, there you go, right? It's always monitoring the width and height of the screen. And JavaScript's really good for that. Okay, so here's I make the game board. I just initialize. I call a couple of functions just to, you know, is this either going to be on or off? That's really all I'm doing. I'm flipping a coin every single time. If it's zero, it's off. If it's one, uh, the cell is alive. And this is the actual rules. So those, those rules that I showed you on the website... Scroll down here. These four four rules are applied here. And it asks these questions. Is it alive? Is it how, how many neighbors are alive? And if it doesn't, it, uh, it it does those changes and it passes it back to be re-rendered. And then you see the new, new universe and it's a uh, new state. All right. And this, uh, this is kind of like routine stuff. This is where it's actually drawing the little boxes on the board. Um, take a look at it. It's a lot different than Ruby. Um, JavaScript is, uh, it's, uh, it's, well, it's a remarkable language. It's kind of, it's uh, very expressive, but it's like also all kind of the bad of every single language mixed together, sort of like the English language. You know, we just kind of adopt whatever suits us. JavaScript's kind of, the, kind of like that. I'd describe it as the English uh, of the programming languages. Very versatile, very adaptive, but uh, it can be hard to learn. Okay. So any questions? I've just been kind of droning on and on. I'm sure you guys want to get to try this. Um, we've got 20 minutes. So I'm going to show you the second set of slides I was provided. And this is really just next step. So if you are really interested, um, 
you've seen what professional web developers do. You've seen the tools that they use. If you want to become more professional, you want to gain more knowledge, um, we're going to give you a very broad overview of the current web ecosystem. So where should you go after Sinatra? Should you learn Rails? I think so. Um, but that really depends, right? Like, do you want to do this? Um, and Rails, I think the strength there really is that you're going to learn some good practices. It's called uh, opinionated, and it punishes you if you uh, act against the prevailing opinion. So in uh, Rails is a very good tool for uh, teams because then you have to you make sure that everyone's uh, following the same practices. So Rails, yeah, very big, very full feature. Um, create your models automatically, create skeleton applications automatically. Um, and as I said, very good for large development teams because it just enforces a certain code of, uh, of development behavior. So do it the Rails way or suffer, it says, and you will. Uh, Sinatra, on the other hand, I think um, it's, I don't know which is easier to learn. Rails has got a lot more goodies, um, but I don't think you would really appreciate it until you got a good grasp of Sinatra. But that's not to say like one is less than the other. It's really just a matter of picking the right tool for the job. Are the uh, like languages inclusive, or are they all uh, integrated? Oh uh, well, um, no. Uh, long depends on what you mean by in integrated. So backing up a second, uh, the languages that Sinatra and Rails use are both Ruby. Uh, Ruby is not the only web development language. Pretty much every language there is has some sort of, well, that's not true, but most languages, popular languages, you can also create web applications with. Um, what Sinatra does and what Rails does is it provides you those frameworks and lets you code in Ruby and deliver a web application. Um, these are two separate frameworks. They don't work alongside each other. I don't see that there's any really op real opportunity for that. But that's not to say that you can't create a Sinatra app, create a separate Rails app, and then have them talk to each other and work together that way. So short answer, no, they're not integrated. Long answer is that yes, anything can be integrated like that. So yeah, Rails very big, mostly gives you much more than you need. If you're someone like myself, um, you try to keep everything as small as possible. So I tend towards Sinatra. Uh, nothing wrong with Rails. It's just much bigger. So, yeah, not a competition. Just pick the right tool for the job. And a big part of picking the right tool is knowing how to use it. Um, it it's, it's kind of hard to conceive of a way you couldn't be good in both Sinatra and Rails because they're... Um, very similar practices, very similar similar culture in many ways. Uh, but yeah, things to consider. A big app, you know, enterprise level app, maybe Rails is better, if only because you're going to need more people to help you. Um, how many users do you expect? Not, I'd say how many developers do you expect, not so many users, because Sinatra and Rails can handle the same, same number, same volume. Um, but yeah, really, is it easier to learn? I'd say Sinatra arguably is easier to learn, but it's always hard. And you have to read the documentation. You have to be, you have to know what you're doing before you do it. So yeah, are there other options? Tons of them. Uh, Rails, I think, is probably the most popular at the moment. Uh, Sinatra, uh, there's not really any good ones up here. I don't see Node. Zend, that was like one of my very first jobs. That's PHP, so totally different language, right? Different different framework. Uh, Django is Python, a uh, good scientific research language, or at least so that's... Do tends all these languages exist within a different group of frameworks? If you say that Django is Python? Yeah. Yes, exactly. We're talking about the difference between general programming and web application development specifically. So these ones provide the boundaries in which you can reuse Python to create a web application, to create your own Instagram. Uh, same thing with uh, Zend. Again, PHP, totally different general purpose language. It's not really general purpose, but it's uh, you know, pretty close. You probably could use it for general purpose reasons. 
um, but it still needs that that those boundaries, and Zend provides those for you. So, oh yes, and lots of JavaScript too, because we're kind of getting to the point where we're using this stuff on the back end and just giving over all the front end stuff to the JavaScript that you just saw with Conway's game of life, the exact same kind of thing. And of course, within that world, there's frameworks as well that just tries to make things easier. Um, I've used React, Angular, jQuery. Uh, this is backend stuff. I've never used Ember, but I've always heard good things about it. I use, uh, these are backend frameworks here, Express and Node. It's that server side stuff. Um, the nice thing about using JavaScript on both front and back is that you know you're not jumping between languages. But even that, that's not really a handicap. It's just more of a mental shift more than anything. Uh, databases as well. So you've seen two, and probably in your lives you've probably been you probably know four or five by name. Um, what's the what's the Microsoft one? Access Microsoft Access. Not a very good database. Uh, but you've probably heard of MySQL, uh, maybe MSSQL, um, Oracle, right? Those are just some of the big names. The one I use most of the time is Postgres. I was playing around a bit with MongoDB. Uh, Redis is kind of a new thing. It's kind of like a database with just key value pairs. And again, I say new, but it's getting less new all the time. Um, another very popular one, MySQL. Uh, I don't use CouchDB. I think that was Adobe. You've used SQLite. I've never used Cassandra, MariaDB, or CouchDB. But, or I never used this Tokyo Cabinet one either. But different databases, different purposes. And not all of them are SQL. So this one's not an SQL database, for example. Neither is Redis. You don't use SQL at all. <coughs> so few similarities. These are all SQL. Um, document collection. I'm not sure how CoachDB or Cassandra structure their documents, but it's, it's the difference between having, say, an Excel-like spreadsheet and having your data organized into rows and columns versus having a Ruby hash, kind of. It's not a Ruby hash. It's actually a JavaScript object, but it's uh, the same kind of idea where you have these key value pairs. These kind of databases uh, use that to organize their data. So a very subtle thing, and you don't use SQL to make queries. Um, and these ones, key value store. So this is like taking that even a step further and taking away the document entirely and just having the key value pairs. Uh, Redis is a very good database. I like that one. It's very fast, but it's not always appropriate. So yeah, that's uh, this all lends itself to this current design trend. We just leave back-end processing to the back-end. We use the front-end stuff for the front-end technologies, like React and Angular, for example. Uh, yeah. React, Angular, Ember. Um, if you're curious, my money's on React. Ember's just kind of falling out of fashion. And Angular, which is Google's offering, and it's, uh, I'd say, a rare miss. It's very difficult to use. It's pretty flaky. React was created by Facebook. It's, uh, it's excellent, very testable. Um, Ember has been, I think, probably been around before either of those. Um, we don't have Ian kicking around. He was one of the mentors. Uh, he's used that. Um, but my money's on React at the moment. That's going to be the one that sticks around for a few years. Uh, yeah, so a, a good thing about what we do with web applications is that this, a lot of this is easily transferable over to native apps. Um, apps, I'm not going to say they've fallen out of fashion, but really, how often do you go to the app store to like download? I don't know. The one I see is the Home Depot app, right? I'm not going to go download that. And every like hardware store, every every business has its own app. It's like, well, why can't I just go to the web page? And really, that's that's the thing. That's, we have web applications, so these sort of native apps are falling increasingly out of fashion. Again, this is opinion. This is me talking here, so. Or someone is going to say something different. Um, but a lot of the time, you can create your web app and bundle it inside of a software like PhoneGap or Electron, which then allows you to submit it to the App Store. So if you still you still have a purpose for that, right? 
you can develop as a web application developer, um, but still create uh, native apps on your phone. This is very useful if you want to do GPS stuff or stuff with your camera. Um, the web hasn't quite caught up to that, that yet. So yeah, automated testing. Oh, I don't want to start yakking about this, but um, just just yesterday. Sorry, I say yesterday. I mean um, last week, um, before the weekend. I was talking to these guys. Getpaper.com. All they're doing is making it so that you can set up a founders agreement and assign equity in startup businesses. And they've got legal boilerplate. So you go sign up for their service, give them some details, and it just prints out all the legal documents. So save yourselves thousands of dollars a year. Big fan of these guys, always trying to help them out. They don't test. They were lamenting this fact. And I say, well, have you started testing yet? Because they need help deploying, right? Doing the DevOps stuff. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to do that. They don't have the time, so I'm doing it for them. They, I asked them toward the end of our conversation, have you started testing? And they say, we don't have time. Half of our development time is spent running manual tests. He says this in the same breath, and it was, for me, so I'm starting to get into rant mode here. Um, that doesn't make a lick of sense, right? There's never going to be a good time to test. You just got to write the test. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a situation where manual testing is eating all your time up and you don't have time to test. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's contradictory. Um, so if you want to be professional, this is definitely opinion. It's a strong one and one I can defend. You can't be a professional unless you test. If anyone says differently, please send them my way. So, yeah, when I'm doing this, it's not something that happens overnight because you have a chicken and egg problem. Um, if you want to be a programmer, you need to test, but if you need to test, I mean, you have to learn to program. So we can't just really show you how to test until you know how, like the basics of programming. So we got this problem and we got this, this cycle where people just avoid it. Um, so I'm at the point where I will always write a failing test, whether it's a unit test, just on some basic functionality, or if it's some sort of integration test, even before I put a button on the web page. I write my test, make sure it fails. Then I put the button on the web page, run my test, and make sure it's there, right? Um, is it a waste of time? No. It's definitely not because then you're going to start clicking that button and you're going to have to see that, you know, your rocket stove video was posted or you were logged in correctly. And you can't do that manually because it will just eat up all of your time. Oh, Yeah. It's just one of those things, I don't know. I don't know what extreme programming is really. Uh, I think I was part of a, um, a team like this when I worked for a company called iStock Photo. Uh, we always programmed in pairs. Uh, people say, I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding. Working in pairs makes you better programmers, produces the product faster. Um, I'm skeptical, but when you see the results, you, you can't really argue with it, right? Uh, we're also talking about agile. This uh, is a term that was, I think, originated in computer science. It's just been sort of adopted throughout all fields of management. Um, and people always, I think they confuse what agile is with uh, some of the management styles that have emerged from it. Agile started out as this. The agile manifesto this hokey web page and the initial signature signatories. Uh, the good stuff is right here. This is the uh, kind of the mission or the vision statement. The actual agile manifesto is just 12 principles, right? So you can become an expert in this in the space of, you know, waiting for the bus or whatever you're doing. Um, and really, this is what's hot right now. There's a few things here that I'm pretty leery of, this one primarily, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and with in a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. I call shenanigans on that. Give me an email, give me a text, give me Slack. It never works face-to-face. -face. Maybe that's just me, but I can never sign the Agile Manifesto. Anybody can come along and sign it, by the way. 
days. So you can get on the list if you like. Just one example, that's, that's agile development. These 12 principles that kind of guide what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> so why that's extreme, I don't, I don't know. It's the same as why it's hypertext hyper. That's, they just come up with these names. GitHub, we've done that. And thank you. Wow, that was like the first class that ended on time. And before anything happens, you guys got like whatever happens tonight, um, you guys got time. Uh, do what you need to do. Let's get your stuff online. Um, it was a pleasure. And it's always a privilege for me to be a part of these uh, uh, these events. So this will, we've had eight here in Calgary and I've been a part of seven. Um, I hope to see some of you back. And if not, I hope to see you around at some of like the meetups. Don't be shy. Come say hi. Thank you again. All right, I'll send this out to you guys and you guys get to work.